despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I ask you, God, tonight, Lord, to help us, Lord. God, help us to say, God, only what you'd have us to say, Lord. God, I pray for the double anointing, God, the double anointing to come, Lord. Lord, and speak only what thus saith the Lord, God. Lord, and when all said and done, all the glory, God, goes back to you because, God, you're the one that's worthy. You're the one that sent your son to die on Calvary, God. Lord, that we might have life, God, and we might have it more abundantly, God. And, Lord, that we might spend eternity with you, God. So I give you all the praise tonight, God. And thank you for such a time. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. You might be seated. Tonight I want to talk to you along the lines, don't ring the bell. Brother Bogle, there's many people today, tonight, right now, before we finish the service tonight, I'll ring the bell. They'll say, I'm done, God. I'm done. I'm finished. So tonight I want to talk. I want us to leave here encouraged. I want us to leave here strengthened, and I hope that we leave on fire for God greater than ever before. I hope that we have an anticipation and expectancy of what God is going to do in each and every one of our lives, greater than we ever have. I hope you hear what Christ has come to say through me tonight. Amen? How many in here tonight will say that you have felt the enemy turn the heat up against you? Amen? I've, I, I've felt it in my own life. You know, I think about it. My pastor back at home said this one time. He said, that submarine, when it goes down in the water, you know, it's got pressure on the inside, Brother Bogle. But the deeper it goes, the greater the pressure has to get. Because if it didn't get greater on the inside, that water would crush it, would crumble it. And it's the same way with us, brother. If we don't get our relationship with God greater than ever before, if we're not praying, if we're not reading, if we're not seeking the face of God for what we need to do throughout the day, and we don't allow the pressure of the Holy Ghost to rise up inside of us, the world will crumble us. Amen? The world will... He, he don't care. He hates you. Hell hates every one of us. If you're a born-again believer, he hates you. He's got a bullseye put on your back, and he's trying to stop you. But we're not going to let him, are we? We're not going to let him. You see, there's nothing greater than being a child of the Most High. I want you to know we're on the winning side. If you'll go back and read the last book of the Bible, it tells us we're the winners. He's the loser. I've heard Dad say it many a times. When we get to heaven, we're going to look down and say, Is that what tempted me? Is that scrawny little thing is what tempted me all of my life? We're the winners, amen? We will win this race long as we stay true to God. I know people, I've heard people say it, people have actually told me, well, I, a preacher told me one time when I get born again, everything gets easy. That's far from the truth. Whenever you start to do things that you should, as Brother Clendenin says, when you get in the will of God, then the trials will come. Then the enemies are going to hit you. He said, I never knew anything about a warfare until I stepped out on the front lines of evangelism. Amen? Until you do something, he'll leave you alone. But you get in the mind of God. You walk in the will of God and do as he's called you to do. You better look out. You better make sure you have on the armor of God. You better make sure you have on God's clothes and not your clothes. You need to get up every morning or in the evening, whenever you want to pray, put on the clothes of God. Every morning, get up say, Father, clothe me with your clothes. Because hell knows when he sees this. Oh, my God, that's God. That's God right there on that man. I can't touch him. But if we walk in our own clothes, in our own spirituality, hell will say, oh, I'll whip him. He's nothing. Put on the clothes of God. It's not going to be easy. It's just the beginning. But I promise you it's worth every trial you've ever had to face. I promise you if some of the men of God or the women of God that have gone on could come back and talk to you, they'd say, oh, there ain't nothing in this world worth losing Christ. Ain't no football game. There ain't none of this. There ain't none of that bonanza. Ain't none of this going to keep me out of the house of God because I want to be with God forever. Amen? So I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the Navy SEALs. Anybody ever heard of the Navy SEALs? Okay. Well, I want to talk to you about the week they have they call Hell Week. It's amazing what a human body can endure. It's amazing the punishment that they have to go through. 
So I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes about it. Hell Week is the defining event of the BUDS training. It's held early on in the third week of the first phase. Therefore, the Navy doesn't waste money on people. Pretty much is what it said. Hell Week consists of five and a half days of the Holiday Inn, Continental Breakfast. No. It says it's five and a half days of cold, wet, brutal difficulties, operational trainings, and fewer than four hours of sleep. So in five and a half days, they are sleeping less than four hours. If I don't get eight hours of sleep at night, I'll wake up grumpy the next day. So I can't imagine. You see, they are tested. Hell Week tests them with their physical endurance, their mental toughness, the pain, the cold tolerance, the teamwork, teamwork, attitude, your ability to perform under high physical and mental stress and without any sleep. Above all, it tests our desire and their determination. I believe, of, uh, not, I'm not talking about Cross Park, so hear me. I'm talking about the church across the board. But I believe for the most part, Brother Bogle, our determination is not what it used to be. Our desires really is not to fulfill the tr true calling of what God has called us to do for whatever reason. Maybe the job, maybe a family member, maybe there's so many things that could keep us from performing it and having that determination. You see, I've been told unless you're really there and experience that, you don't have a clue what they face. You don't understand the mental pain that they go through. It is known to be the toughest training in the United States military. I've seen some videos. I was studying, watching, looking, watching videos. My God, what a terrible thing. Them men, grown big boys, throwing their guts up, trying to walk, can't even walk, stumbling and falling because they want to be part of the greatest force in this world, on this world. They want to be in the military, the United States of America. You see, they're constantly in motion. They're running, they're swimming, they're paddling, carrying boats on their head, doing PT, doing sit-ups, push-ups, rolling in the sand, slogging through the mud, paddling boats, doing surf passage. And being still can be just as challenging when you're having to stand in formation in the soaking wet on the beach. They say that the water, they make them stand for hours in the water up to their waist. They're hit with that cold wind off of the ocean and it just cuts right through every bit of clothing you have on. You see the mud covers their uniform, their hands, their face, everything but the eye. And the sand chafes the raw skin. It causes raw spots all over their body and then they have to get in the salt water and it burns them. These are just a few things that they have to endure, not mentioning the mind telling them, why don't you just quit? Why don't you stop? Look over here. It started out with 4,000 men. There's only 2,000 left. There's already 2,000 cowards that's left. Why don't you leave? Ain't nobody looking. Ain't nobody care if you come to church on a Wednesday night. You know how no hell tells people that? Look, look around. A lot of us are missing on a Wednesday night. Amen? I remember when churches used to be full on a Wednesday night. The Holy Ghost and fire would fall on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night or whenever you had church. It didn't matter. But you see, hell's cause so many people to just say well I really just on Wednesday nights just kind of go and hang out no you're here for a reason God has set you here for a reason you're a part of the church one part of the body's sick or ill the whole body's not functioning correctly amen you see does this sound familiar to us so why don't you stop why don't you give up I want you to know hell has told that lie to many to many and they're falling out by the droves but we must stand and we must walk and do the will of God we have to stand and be the church that God's called us to be you see in the hell week this is to make men and women realize that they can do more than they ever thought that they could it pushes them beyond anything that they could ever imagine because most of the battle from the studies that I've been doing and research is here it's in the mind if you can keep telling your mind, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, your body's going to follow. But when that mind says, oh, I can't do it, that body's going to sit down. That body's going to wear out and give up. But we, every day, got to get up and say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I'm going to stand. I'm going to fight. It doesn't matter if it costs me everything, Brother Bogle. If I lose my wife or my children, if I lose my house, if I lose my job, whatever, I have to know that I will stand. I will not ring that bell. I will not surrender and say, I'm finished, God. But no, I'm going to grow closer to God. 
You see, the instructor doesn't really want them to fail, but he says, I know if I can just whisper in there, if I can get them to quit now, just imagine what they'll do on the battlefield. If they didn't really push a man or a woman and train them and try to get them to stop and to quit and to bow out, when they get in the battlefield, they're sitting there and they're hiding. They're hiding and they're in war. Everybody's shooting. There's a lot of guns being fired. They're sitting here. And if they've not been physically and mentally trained, they'll cower out, Brother Bogle. They'll start whining. They'll start saying, I want to go home to mama. I'm not being mean, but they'll do it. They'll, and you know, the next thing the enemy hears, oh, I hear somebody that's in distress. Oh, they're ready to quit and give up. I'm headed over to them. And the next thing you know, it's happened in the wars before. They do that. The enemy comes over and wipes them out all because of one cowering out. So that's why they put them through such torment, so much pain, because they want them to stand true. They don't want them to cower down because they know the enemy will kill them. The one thing I found out about this, through all my research and my study, just because you think they'll make it, just because he looks like an athlete in the Navy SEALs, just because he's a macho man, he's got all the muscles, they said they're the number ones to fall out, Brother Bogle. They said the ones that usually make it are scrawny little people like Stephen McKay, little skinny guys. They say the reason is because they made up in their mind, I'm going to become that seal. I'm going to be part of the greatest force that's ever marched on this world. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And so they tell themselves that time and time again. But you see, the problem is, one thing that bothers me the most as I was studying this, in their Navy SEALs, they have the compound, they have a bell set right up here in the middle, Brother Bogle. They don't hide it behind a tree. Hell's not going to let you quit serving God over here behind a tree. You're going to have to walk out in front. You're going to have to crawl out here in the middle, in the middle of the compound, and you have to say, I quit. They've got to ring that bell, Brother Bogle, three times. Not only do they ring the bell, but they have to take off the helmet. How many knows the helmet's the helmet of salvation? So when they ring that bell, they have to go a step farther. They have to lay their helmet of salvation down and say, God, I've completely turned away from you. I'm not going to serve you any longer. So we have to be careful not to allow the devil to, to cause us to stop. I've seen a video of the man three times. That's how to get out. You got to ring it three times. The instructor will tell them, say, hey, if you'll quit now, I'll give you coffee and donuts and a blanket. Go ring the bell three times. You know, but I know there's, there's men and women that's walked away saying, man, I wish I'd have held out. I wish I would have finished the race. And when we get, when we get to heaven, there's going to be thousands upon thousands of millions that say, God, I wish I'd have finished the race. God, I started off strong, but it ain't how you start. It don't matter that you started off and you've won 10 million people to God. It's how you finish the race. You may start off whipping all the Goliaths, but if you don't stay true to God and if you don't fast and you don't pray and you don't kneel before God and say, God, I'm not going to make it if you don't help me, then you'll never finish the race. Hell's going to be full of a lot of people that started this race. What are we going to do about it, church? Admiral William McRaven said these famous words. They asked him, said, what is the key to go through SEAL training? And this is what he said. I quote him. It, or he said, it's simple. You just don't quit. Sounds easy, don't it? We got to make up in our mind. I'm not ringing this bell. That's a sign of defeat. That ain't a sound I want to hear, Brother Bogle. That's a sign of a coward. That's a sign of a man or a woman that says, I'm done. I can't take it. The devil's been on my back. He's told me all week, you're never going to make it. You're a nobody. Everybody dislikes you. They don't like the way you look. They don't like how your hair is parted. They don't like what you wear. They don't like how you smell. They don't like how you look. Maybe you sing off key. Maybe you can't clap on beat. It doesn't matter what hell tells you. We have to finish the race, church. We have to put the bell up and never pick it up again. That is the problem with most of the people today. We're ringing the bell, and we can't.
How many agree we can't quit? We have to make up in our mind, whatever comes down the pike, I'm going to stand. I will not ring the bell. I'm going to finish the race. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to bow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had an opportunity to ring the bell. They said, not on your life, king. All they had to do was bow down. They, I'm sure they could have made it. She's, oh, God will understand if because we're going to die if we don't bow. But they said, no. They took the bell and they threw it away. They said, King, whatever you say, whatever you may try to do to us, God can deliver us if he don't. Oh, well, but I'm going to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we all know the story. Jesus Christ got in the fire with them. The three come out. He's still there for me and you. Amen. Amen. What if the church had this kind of grit about ourselves and we'd see the world around us changed, amen? If we had the grit of what it takes to be a Navy SEAL, if we had the grit to lay the bell down and never to pick it up again, if we had the grit to say, God, I'm going to serve you, how much greater would our services be? How much more would be taking place in Cross Park Assembly of God? How many people would be getting filled with the Holy Ghost? How many salvations? How many marriages that are torn all to pieces because the enemy's wreaked havoc and there ain't enough of God in here to knock a flea off a dog's back? If we had it, if we had the true Holy Ghost, the true power, the true anointing of God, marriages don't have to fall apart. Lost loved ones can be saved. Blinded eyes be open, cancers be healed. I know sister don't mind me sharing, but one night I preached. She came up for prayer, and I just felt the Lord say, put your hands on her throat. I prayed for that individual. Several of us prayed for her. She went back to the doctor, and if I'm incorrect, correct me. But they said, honey, you ain't got nothing wrong. They said, you can go on. We'll see you in six months for a checkup. But what I'm trying to tell you is somebody has to find the mind of God. It had nothing to do with me. I was just a willing vessel. Beg God, please use me. If you can use anything, Lord, please use me. And that's what he's looking for, a willing vessel. Someone that wants to be used. You see, when the church member decides the church really isn't worth it, then utter chaos takes over. You say, well, I'm not sure about this. Well, I want to tell you something that will prove you wrong. Not negatively, just want to tell you. Right here in the Bible Belt last weekend, they had the LGBT movement. Right here, downtown Johnson City. This is the Bible Belt, people. This ain't New York City. This is the Bible Belt, but yet we had a first kind of, vessel of, of a festival of its own. It was called the Tri-Pride Parade. It celebrated the LGBT community and all its allies. One lady says, everyone deserves a chance to be who they really are. No, what you need to do is get born again. That's what you need to do. I see there was uh, roughly around 10,000 people that attended it. 10,000 people attended Founders Park to spread the message of love and unity. People within the LGB community call this a historic day for our region. Do you hear what I'm saying? Ten years ago, five years ago, that wouldn't happen. You know why? Because the church said it ain't happening. We're going to have prayer meeting. We're going to be men and women of God at church. We're going to be that at the restaurant. We're going to be the man of, or the woman of God at the house. We're going to be that at the job. Wherever we go, we're going to show the love of God. And so for years, stuff's been pushed back. But the church let her guard down. We've allowed things to come in. You see, the streets were lined as the parade kicked off around noon. The community here has always been supportive, but it never acted. Now we're active, says the local drag queen, Anna. You know why I never acted? Because God used to be everything. But he's not anymore. I'm not talking about you people because I know you love God. It's a Wednesday night and you're here, so I know you love God. But the church across the board, we've called... We've called sin good. We've called good evil. The preaching that dad does up here, they said that man's crazy. He's lost his mind to preach like that. What, why would somebody get up here and scream and holler for an hour? What, what is the point in that? I had one, somebody tell me one day I invite them to church. They said, I won't be back to your church. I said, why? 
He said, that, that crazy man out there preaching has got his hair on fire or something. So he runs and spins and jumps. I said, that's the Holy Ghost on fire. Getting a hold of him, preaching the truth to us, convicting our hearts. They said, well, I just ain't into that. Well, to each his own, amen? I believe in the true God. Church, like I said, it wasn't New York City, but it's right here in the Tri-Cities. Church, when will we wake up, smell the coffee beans, and realize it's time to get back to the basics of life? Back to when it was black or white? Back when it was right and wrong? Back when sin was sin? If it feels good, do it. That's the number one thing I hear all the time. Oh, everybody's doing it. Feels good, I'm going to do it. No, no. That ain't right. If it feels good, don't do it. Unless you're in the presence of the God and he gets a hold of you and it feels good, let him take over and do whatever he wants, Brother Bogle. I'm waiting on you to run. One of these nights, you're, gonna, no, you're not going to come right here. You're going to go on around the building. Amen. I'm waiting for it. I believe it. You see, the church across the board has allowed the world to come in to the church to act like the world to draw a bigger crowd. You see, it isn't what the church needs. What we need is our prayer warriors to be praying and the people of church to get on fire for God and to do whatever God says, not to allow anything to keep us out of the house of God. I know it may sound redundant, but I just don't get it. I've never seen such a generation of people that'll miss the house of God for everything or anything. I mean, just whatever it is. Oh, well, my nose kind of twitched. I'm going to stay home. What? But I'm going to get up and go to work tomorrow. You see, I've never seen a generation. People miss God's house for so many things. we got to get it right. We have to be the men and women that won't allow our brothers and our sisters to ring that bell. Do you hear me? We have to be. When you see a brother headed for that bell, you say, No, don't do that. Don't do that. Let me help you. I, I, I've been there. I've, I've almost wanted to quit before, but let me tell you, it ain't worth it. Stay with me. I'll help you. We'll walk together. Like you said, we're going to walk this race together. That's one thing that's beautiful about the race of God. We help one another. We're not trying to outdo each other. But in order to be the one to help out, we must be prayed up and ready. Got to be prayed up and ready. You see, there have been times hell's beating me down and be honest with you, I thought about it, Brother Bogle. I was headed to the bell. I already had my buckle undone on the helmet, ready to put it down. God said, you can't do it, son. You can't do it. And I just held on. I said, God, I'm not going to ring the bell. I'm not going to do it. There'd be times I thought about doing it, a message will come on. Or a song will come on. Or somebody will speak a word into my life. And I'm like, man, God, you are, you are so good. I feel like sometimes that I felt like I'm so far away from you, God, but yet you're right there. You never left me. You never forsaken me. You've always been there with me. You see, we have to stand. We're still here and we have a work to do. If we don't ring the bell, then when Jesus Christ comes back, we'll have completed and become a part of the greatest force ever. We will rule and we will reign with Christ. Amen. Are you going to rule and reign with Christ? I'm going to. We have to watch and make sure that the devil doesn't let us fall out, allow us and kick us down and make us fall out. Because if we fall out, church, listen, if we fall out, we don't just fall out. Somebody's watching you. If Brother Bogle's the backslide tomorrow and walk away, somebody would be hurt big time. You know, they probably think, well, my God, if that white-headed man preaches like he does. He can't stay for God. I can't. Look at me. Who am I? But you see, we have to hear what God says. You see, this, ain't, this is not true. The devil is not going to just let you think it's all you by yourself. He'll tell you that, but I want you to know it ain't. We're helping one another. You see, if you fall out, it affects others. People watch you. I don't care how old you may seem you are. And I don't care how young you think you are, somebody's watching you. Somebody is watching you. They need you to survive. Church, please don't ring the bell. You see, it's like in our opening text, there's a cloud of witnesses rooting you on saying, come on, you can make it. You can make it. Brother Curtis, 
don't quit. You can make it. Come on. Brother James, don't quit. Keep running. Brother Ralph, don't stop. Keep running. You can make it. Brother Joe, don't you dare quit. Don't you, you, my Lord, don't you quit. We're all almost home. Keep running the race. Keep marching toward the prize. Amen. Rooting us on, telling us don't stop. Listen to that, not the devil. And I'm reminded of this verse, 1 John 4, 4. Ye are, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You see, the world don't have Christ, so the world can't make it through things that we can make it through. It's like the song I sang tonight, you ask me how it is that I'm still standing. You wonder how I made it through these storms and that storm. It's not because of me. It's not because of all of this. It's because of God. Jesus Christ living on the inside. That is the reason we are conquerors. We will overcome. You know, I was thinking about our little daughter Maggie. She's crazy about her mother. She loves mama. Mama loves Maggie. <clears throat> so we take her to kindergarten. She just starts this year. and She has a terrible start. She cries. She whines. She pitches fits. She says, I'm not going to school. I'm staying home with mama. That's what she said. I'm staying with mom. And, you know, we kept trying, praying with her and everything. And I got a verse. And I said, honey, I want, to, I want you to quote this verse with daddy. And I want you to repeat it to yourself every day when you wake up, when you go to bed. She said, okay, daddy, what is it? I said, Philippians 4.13. You know, we've all quoted. We all know it. It sounds childish at times. But it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And one day she went to school. She actually got out of the car without pitching a fit. She grabbed her brother's hands and cried the whole way in. I'm in the car basket case myself crying. Mama, she's, she's totally lost it. She's just crying and crying. So Maggie got home that day. I said, honey, tell daddy how school was. She said, well, daddy, I got nervous. She said, but I, I looked at the picture that mama gave me of our family and of me and Bubba. And she said, when I'd get nervous, she'd say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You're talking about make daddy want to cry. I said, what'd you say, baby? She said, daddy, I, I did it all day. Every time I got nervous, I said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That childlike faith. It seems a childish verse, but I, it got her through. She has no problem now. She gets out of the car. Well, she, she still has a little bit of problem. She still wants Bubba's hand. But she'll get out of the car and she'll go. And she loves school now. But where, where is our childlike faith? Why can't that verse do to us as it did her? we got to get back to the childlike faith, knowing that it's only through Christ that we make it through the day. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes, and then I'm closing. I'm, I'll be done in a few minutes. I'm about tired, Brother Bo. I want to talk to you about Jeremiah the prophet. We know that God called him and he had a hard road for him. No doubt he had a great inner turmoil over, over the fate of his people. He begged them to listen and we know him as the weeping prophet because he cried tears of sadness. Not only he knew what was about to happen, but no matter how hard he tried, the people wouldn't listen. Furthermore, he found no human comfort. He was not to marry or have sons or daughters in this place. You see, he had to depend on on God. That's all he had was God. He depended on God for everything. He didn't have a spouse to talk to about the crazy things and say, honey, today was terrible. The day at the office was horrible. Or vice versa. The wife said, honey, I was at the office today. It was terrible. He didn't have that. He had God. He had what he had. He preached the word of God. You see, this is what it said. He didn't have anybody to lean on. We read what God tells him. I'm going to read the amplified version just for a little bit of clarity of understanding some of the words. Jeremiah chapter 16 verses 3 and 4. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place and concerning the mothers who give birth to them and the fathers who father them in this land. Listen. They will die a deadly disease. They will not be mourned or buried. They will be like dung on the surface of the ground and come to an end by sword and famine and their dead bodies will be food for the birds and the airs and the food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth. He knew all of this. 
Yet he still preached the word of God. He knew that the children had become so hardened in their heart that they were continued in their sin that they become numb. They no longer believed God. They no longer feared him. Jeremiah preached for some 40 years and not once did he see any real change or softening of the hearts and minds as they were a stubborn and an idolatrous people. Sounds a lot like today, don't it? Stubborn and idolatrous. Anything can be an idol, church, if we allow it. You see, he preached day in and day out and not much fruit in return. Church, this is what the world is like today. We become so hardened in our hearts that we don't care about the things of God, but we care about ourselves more. And I'm talking about most people, not everybody. But I can tell you that Jeremiah was beat down. He wanted to quit. And he said this in Jeremiah 20 and 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his words was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. You know, it could have been easy for old Jeremiah. He's never seen any, anybody do anything. It could have been easy for him to say, all right, I'm done, God. You know, I, I've tried. I've been doing this for 40 years. Ain't nobody come to you. I'm done. I'm taking off the helmet of salvation. I'm walking out. But you know what he said? He said, no, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. It's like Dad said, I've tried to quit. I've tried to walk away. You can't. God gets a hold of you. You've had an encounter with God. It's hard to walk away from him. I'm not saying that you can't because it happens. People do backslide. But I'm saying, I, I can't. Hell's tried to get me to, and there's times I thought I would, but I can't imagine walking this walk without God. This is what I'm talking about. Though it doesn't look like much has happened in your life, it does not mean you ring the bell, amen? But all the contrary, we have to serve Jesus Christ, do the will of God, not hide from this world, but rather stand up and preach the gospel of Christ, amen? Galatians 6 and 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Where is the burning fire shut up in our bones? We can have it, amen? Jeremiah had it, then that means we need it. God's not a respecter of persons. If he give it to Jeremiah, he'll give it to you. He'll give it to me. He'll give it to anybody that wants it, but we must desire it. Church, please, if you hear nothing, I, I beg you to hear this. Please don't ring the bell. Please don't quit. I want to close with a couple of scriptures and then we'll stand and come around the altar. I want you to remember these verses. Psalms 139 and 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right. It says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You're not a robot. Sears didn't make you. GMC didn't make you. The Heavenly Father created you. Amen? So we are fearfully and wonderfully made by the Creator of all things. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. If you would, let's stand. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Go ahead and start getting your mind on Christ. And we're about to come around these altars for a few moments and pray. But I got a question. Let's, let's close our eyes and bow our heads. I don't want to embarrass anybody. How many will be honest and say, Brother Billy, I thought about ringing the bell. Some of you may even be here tonight and have the bell in hand. ready to ring it but God said no you can't ring the bell if there's anyone here that, that maybe that's you maybe you have the thought to ring it or maybe you've even had it in your hand let's raise your hand I don't want to embarrass you I just want you to raise your hand amen how many is thankful that God loves us so much that he'll warn us about what state we're in or what is coming down the road amen Maybe not tonight, but in the near future, the devil's going to come around to you. Maybe he even hand you the bell and say, stop. Hopefully you'll remember tonight. I'm not going to ring the bell. If you would, let's come around these altars and let's respond. Ask God to help us and not to ring.